This is Geek Gab with your host, John and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. Geek Gab for Saturday, January 27th, 2018. We have at least one and as many as two special guests on the show today. But be, uh, before we do, I want to say hello to my good co-host, uh, John, a.k.a. Doranall, who was, we swear, we absolutely swear, we scouts on our swear, was absolutely planning on doing an uh, game night broadcast this last week, but did not actually get around to it. And so if you could all in the chat send him judgmental, send him words of judgmental condescension and scorn, I think all of us would appreciate it. I appreciate being the center of scorn on this show. There's lots of good stuff happening in tabletop these days. I'm really excited to talk about it, but uh, but I suppose we're here to talk about cool science fiction books instead. Are, are, but are you actually going to – are we going to get around to doing that show? We're going to do that. I mean, yeah, we, we've got some dumb tweets to talk about, maybe some new uh, news as far as – the most, the oldest and most venerable name in in role playing. Uh, I'm sure anybody who uh, hangs out on Twitter knows what's going on. Um, plus, you know, we haven't talked we haven't talked game design and and mechanics in a while, and and that's always fun for well nerds like us. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll put some together. We'll talk uh, we'll talk sometime in the next seven days. All right, folks. Um, now we have on the show with us. Uh, well. We were planning on having on the show with us Jason Onspock and Nick Cole to come along and talk about how they convinced Amazon's algorithms to sell their books for them. But Jason has just recently had his seventh child, and so he may not be joining us. If he does, we will, of course, welcome him. But definitely the man who will be joining us, I think, for the third time on Geek Gab is author and actor Nick Cole from the balmy shores of Los Angeles. Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a nice day to be in LA. And I would definitely love to talk tabletop and hear all the cool, cool Twitter stuff. And we're actually uh, starting to get into uh, game design for our property. So that would be fun. You know, I, I would love to talk about that if we can squeeze that in. That'd be fun. But um, I'm here to talk about, you know, publishing and, and convincing a Amazon with voodoo. Because here's the thing. Um, you have, it isn't so much, you see a lot of people, they're selling ebooks about different tips and tricks, how to trick the, you know, Department of Education into giving you a grant for this or how to uh, have life hacks on drop shipping or whatever. Right. Um, but your guys' approach to getting Amazon, and, and we should say it, it's a very, very successful approach. Well, I'll tell you how successful it is, or, or Nick will tell you how successful it is in just a minute. Your guys' approach is not so much a tip or a trick or an oversight. It is observation on how Amazon themselves has uh, quite systematically and cleverly set up their algorithms to suggest to readers books that are like books they have liked in the past or have enjoyed in the past so that they will go ahead and have a greater chance of buying those books. If a person buys a lot of zombie novels, you're going to recommend them another zombie novel. You're not going to recommend them a bodice-tearing historical romance from the Elizabethan period. It just probably isn't going to sell unless there were also zombies. Right. So you and guys managed to, to figure this out and have described how the, the algorithm works better than anybody else I've seen. Well, it came out like for me, it came out of a personal experience of ending up in a few different ghettos. And I think you were, you were, you were the first kind of person to, pioneer that whole um, observation that you can end up in these ghettos in the also bot system. You can end up in the Castilia house ghetto. And I, I, I've ended up in a few, my books, I should say, have ended up in a few ghettos. And, and what happens when you get into that ghetto is 
you suddenly have all these books in your also bots and then also bots are clues of, of who, who is seeing your book, what kind of reader is seeing your book, um, what crowd it's being sold to, what genre interests things. So when you look at the also bots, it's like that old saying that your mother might have used on you, which is show me a picture of your friends and I'll show you, you know, a picture of you in 20 years or whatever it is. But um, the problem with also bots and being in ghettos is it's incestuous and it can suddenly cause your sales to sales to stagnate. So when I first started out on Amazon in 2011 with my first book, The Old Man in the Wasteland, I got a hit out of that, sold 69,000 copies, got a major publishing contract deal and had no idea how the Amazon algorithm worked. I would have told you at the time that I thought I knew how it worked. And then I went to HarperCollins and they immediately were unable to reproduce the level of sales that I that I had with the book that I gave them and the two sequels, The Savage Boy and The Road is a River, and those got collected into the Wasteland Saga. And when they first sent me my first royalty statements, I was like shocked. I was like, you guys are selling this few amount of books. And they would say, yeah, but we have this large mailing list and we're sending you out to that and everything like that. And the only metric that I had to look at was Amazon. You know, I can't see their bookstore stuff. And also those books didn't get into bookstores for like two years. And it only got in, in, in into a, uh, bookstores in a badly packaged omnibus version, which required people who had bought the first two books to rebuy them again. So that was a big mistake. But I, I, I went through a good three to four years of having from, from having wild sales to having a sales slump. And I did some different projects with other author, authors, other big name indies. And I started to watch the also bots and I could see that I couldn't get away from like my fellow authors and they weren't always writing the same things that I was writing. Sometimes they were writing time travel stuff. Sometimes they were writing Amish prepper stuff. Sometimes they were writing horror, you know, and sometimes they were flat out writing straight sci-fi. And I knew that there was a problem here. And I, and I used to think like, well, okay, if you write a book like Soda Pop Soldier and you get an also bot with Ernest Kleins who wrote Ready Player One, that's a good indicator that you're in a good ghetto, you know, a good place to where you could, you could sell things. But the trick was how to do that. And so I began to discuss that and discuss that with a few other people. And I read uh, a, an author whose name, who, by the name of Chris Fox. And Chris Fox was a data um, science guy who worked in the dot-com industry in San Francisco. And he began to write books and he experienced some of the same problems that we all experienced. And he began to look at the science of, of data with respect to how algorithms, the, the algorithm sells your books. Now, everybody knows that I'm a long-winded person and I have a tendency to give huge answers. I now have to stop and back up and tell a little short story about Amazon and artificial intelligence. And everybody thinks that artificial intelligence is this huge, hot, new, relevant Elon Musk control alt revolt term and it is but what most people don't understand is that when amazon was formed in the mid 90s from the get-go they jeff bezos wanted to pioneer the ai amazon's ai is light years beyond anybody else's ai nobody's even coming close to amazon's ai not even the government not even the biggest dot coms not apple nobody nobody People don't understand the power of Amazon, and a lot of its power is its its AI. It operated for five years in the loss in law in the in the red, just to make that AI work. And once that AI began to work and turned on, it sells a lot of books. So I told that part. Now we're going to tell one other part. Here's how the AI works, and this is the the most fundamental thing that everybody needs to wrap their heads around about how books are sold on Amazon. Books are sold on Amazon by selling to the buyer's sales history. And that when you when you when you and that seems innocuous, but most people don't think that. Most people think that books are sold because of their name, like, hey, I'm Nick Cole and everybody should buy Nick Cole books. Or hey, I'm selling um, science fiction space marine books, and so they're gonna sell my book. Um, to anybody who's typing in science fiction space marine, it doesn't work that way. How it works is, and a, and a good example is to use mayonnaise. Amazon has spent so much time data mining you 
with this AI that when it decides to show you a can of mayonnaise, because it found out that you needed mayonnaise, whether Alexa was looking in, listening in on, to, in on you, or whether your Google search was looking up recipes for a good crab dip, a spicy crab dip, and it's going to require mayonnaise, and you're going to go on to Amazon Prime and order something. Amazon has three options to sell you mayonnaise. It has Best Foods. It has Miracle Whip, if you consider that mayonnaise, and everybody's passionate about that. And then let's say it has um, the Costco version, which a lot of people say is the same as Hellman's. And it knows by everything that it's data mined about you, which of those three mayonnaises it's most likely to get a sale of by showing it to you. And it's arcane and it's obscure and it's all this kind of stuff. But we have to wrap our minds around as authors understanding that it's not selling me and it's not selling the book. What it's doing is it's selling to the buyer's sales history. And so once you understand that, what you can begin to understand is that genre and keywords are very important. So I know there's the whole, you guys are part of the whole pulp rev move and everything like that. And that's solid and that's strong. The problem that most authors had is most, most authors for their history of writing have been told you have to be different. You have to come up with a unique twist. You have to, you have to genre bend. You have to combine time travel with lesbian Eskimo fiction. You have to, you know, you have to do all these kind of crazy things to be interesting and stand out. Well, that's not how the algorithm works. What the algorithm is looking for is, is can it easily package you as in you write space marine fiction and it happens to have some galactic conquest elements and then it will, it will market pe to people's sales histories those two keywords, those two genres. So in the way that Amazon sells books, it becomes very important to understand genre and keywords it becomes critically important. And being a standout person is, is much less important. Doing something interesting or genre bending is less important. I was actually just having a conversation with a very big author and he does a lot of very erudite, intelligent, literary uh, kind of stuff. And I said, the reason you're not selling is no, Amazon can't package you. It doesn't understand. Well, yeah, but it's this, it's Game of Thrones meets, uh, you know, a prayer for Owen Meany. No. The Amazon, the algorithm doesn't know how to package you. It does, on the other hand, know how to sell the hell out of Conan books. It does, on the other hand, know how to sell the hell out of Space Marine books or romance books. So in a certain sense, the books have to become simpler and more entertaining. And then the biggest, the next key to that is cover, because cover is 80% of the buy decision. So what we learned from Chris Fox was that data science was very important and that you could coax the algorithm through a series of steps to get it to sell your books more effectively. Now, here's, um, I wanna step back from that for just half a second and derive from that or analyze from that what Amazon's book market is like on the site. Now, this doesn't apply to people who are traditional publishing that are being sold in, in stores. And a lot of those are going away anyway, but what Amazon is doing is packaging books in an easily digestible format so that a, an average reader or the average reader on Amazon, the average reader who purchases a number of ebooks through Amazon, they tend to buy the same books in the same genre again and again and again. If you like zombie novels, you're going to tend to buy a lot of zombie novels. If you like steampunk novels, you're going to tend to buy a lot of steampunk and almost never. Are you going to buy, if you like steampunk, are you going to buy space marine fiction or zombie novels? And so Amazon presumes that there is, and, and I say this presumes, it is built into the algorithm or how the algorithm functions. And we have to assume based not only on success in selling, but on the long, the long amount of time that's gone into fine tuning this algorithm to the realities of their market. So we have to assume that Amazon is doing this correctly. Correct. Amazon assumes or presumes that there are large numbers of readers who frequently buy and read uh, several books or many books in a month or a year, and that those individuals are very, very, very 
optimist to their preferred genre, but don't really care all that much about the author's name, they will read, if they like urban fantasy, they'll read Jim Butcher's Dresden Files series, but they almost will never touch the uh, Aeronauts Windless or the um, his other uh, epic fantasy series. Right. And we, so... We found that they we have, found that, that that generally there is no genre jump between readers, not even for someone you you're, you very eruditely stated not even for Jim Butcher. And so, because Amazon has fine tuned their algorithm for the realities of its marketplace. Um, and I'm just going to assume for the discussion that they're correct because I don't have any information. I don't know that anybody has any information that could prove them wrong. Um, because they well, have, let, let me jump in there. I, cause, cause you guys, you, you understand that it's an algorithm, but, but you're speaking as if there's a judgment call being made. And, and I'd, I'd like to, I want to clear that up because it's not about right or wrong. The, the whole idea of the artificial intelligence is that it's attempting to make an intelligent decision based on the information that it has. That's all it means. It's not it's not magic or anything. I, I mean, I'm a software engineer, so maybe maybe to right. your average listener, it sounds like magic. It sounds so, like magic they're, to me. They're, <laughs> yeah. They, they, so so all they've done is, like, at a very high level, they've encoded all this data that we are are silly enough to give them about our lives. Right. Like you mentioned, Alexa listening in, right? Right. They take all this information and they try to figure out how can we sell it to this guy, and it's. It's not a secret that their that Amazon's also bought is the way they make sales, but I think the way you guys have figured out how to leverage that is is genius. Well, and I, and so I, we, I think I think Daddy Warpig has something to finish, but I I want to jump in there and just say one thing: the algorithm can also work against you, and that's what happens to ninety percent of the people if you if you don't coax it right. So go ahead. The point I was driving towards is um, presuming that Amazon is correct about the behavior of buyers on their site. Um, then if you as an author want to sell books on Amazon, and if you're going to be deriving the largest portion of your income from sales on Amazon, then you need to target your works at, at this algorithm to get it to sell your books because that will enable you, it's a force multiplier. It's not going to be able to replace good writing, and it's not going to be able to replace a great cover, but it's a force multiplier as far as getting your word of your books out to an audience who will be interested in buying it. Correct. Yeah. But here's, here's, here's one of the problems, and it's, it's uh, what John was saying is, is absolutely true. It doesn't make any value judgments on whether your book is good or bad. And I think a lot of people used to put a lot of weight into the review system and the stars. And I don't think there's actually that. I think that's actually been, uh, as we've seen with a lot of review systems in our modern culture, um, they've actually been watered down. Uh, that's why Netflix, you know, one of the reasons Netflix took away all the stars is the review system was hurting their agenda. So, you know, that's, that's one of the things to look at. But here's where it gets really wacky. So you write a Space Marine novel and you immediately go out onto social media or let's just say you go to your mom and you say, mom, I just, brought, I, just, I just wrote a Space Marine novel. Would you go and buy it on Amazon so I'll get a sale and the algorithm will sell more books for me? So we jump back to that seller's, um, uh, the, the algorithm sells to the buyer's sales history. And your mother goes and buys that book. Well, your mom's been buying a lot of gardening and cooking books lately. And the, the algorithm, as, as John was saying, it's not, it doesn't make these value judgments. The way that I like to actually think of the, mal the algorithm instead of a Silas from Control-Alt-Revolt, I like to actually think of it as a minion. You know, that cute little Disney thing, whatever that is. Um, and, and it's just very kind and it's, it's very hopeful. The minion desperately wants to sell your book. And it's looking to collect all the information that it can to sell your book. And it's going to do a good job with it once it gets that information. And that's, that's a fact. Amazon, even when it sells badly, will do its best to sell badly. But here's the problem. 
it makes its value judgment on your book by some of the first purchases. And my personal theory, unconfirmed, is about 100 purchases path that book inside Amazon. Path is a computer term. I'm probably using it badly, but what it really means is it shows how something will work through a system. It paths through the system. So if you get some gardening, you, you know, if, if the book, if your mom buys the gardening book, or if your mom buys your Space Marine book, and she's bought a lot of gardening and cooking books, in a very simplified format, Amazon is going to start attempting to sell your Space Marine book, it's going to show it to people who cross over into gardening and cooking. They, they're going to be like, hey, I'm looking for gardening and cooking books, not, you know, uh, war dogs, you know, of, of Cyclone. And they're going, to they're going to bypass it. So the, first, the, the way that you train the algorithm is in pathing it initially within its launch within the system. And what you're looking for are pure genre readers. Like we like that, like Daddy Warpig was talking about. You're looking for this very specific set that picks up one Jim Butcher book and moves on to the next Jim Butcher book, moves on to the next Jim Butcher book, works their way through that, and then starts working their way through the also bots that look like the cover of another Jim Butcher book. There, I write when I first sort of started getting popular, most people would have considered me a post apocalyptic author. Then people would have considered me a zombie author. Then I became sort of a PKD author with um, Control Alt Revolt and Soda Pop Soldier. So I'm kind of all over the place. But right now, Amazon is recognizing me mostly as a military science fiction author. And so it, that, that's, that, yeah. That, well, go ahead. That, that makes a lot of sense what you're saying about the algorithm and the, and the sales, the, and the initial sales. Because the initial sales are very important. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you think about it from the algorithm perspective, remember that it's just it, – it's, it, it's a minion. It is a minion. It's just a program that's trying to figure out who should see this book, and it's exactly. using all the information that it can get. So at the beginning, when you launch your book, it has terabytes upon terabytes of data on the users. It has right. no information about your book. It needs it needs you called it a path. I would call it like an initial seed. Like right. it needs it needs it needs a place to start from. And if it and Amazon's got these genres, and if it if it can put your book in a bucket, in the, you know in the biggest or the most appropriate bucket, then it knows who to show it to. So that right. makes sense. I so, I think it's strange. I think it's strange that it's weighted so heavily f towards those first hundred. Uh, yeah, it'll. You know, Amazon's always changing. So they, you know, they they could go back to making reviews weighted. They they mess around with it all the time, and just because you figure out one system, if you're going to write books as an indie author, it's vital that you constantly be trying new systems and be listening to other people because Amazon, Amazon changes systems like people have bowel movements. You know, it just it's constantly updating. But so we take a publishing house like Castilia House. And, you know, they're publishing Martin Van Krebel, you know, and they're pu publishing economics people and they're publishing John C. Wright and they're publishing Control Out Revolt and they're publishing, you know, some comic books and everything like that. The problem is, is that when Castilia House goes to their mailing list right off the bat, they kill your novel. They get you a lot of sales. Great. You got everybody who, who, who sold books at Castilia House. But the problem is they're not genre specific readers and that's what kills your book. And, and, and that is a macrocosm of what we are all doing in the microcosm. And I was doing it up until a year ago, which is you get your book up, you go right to social media and you tell everybody on social media. Well, in my social media channel, I have actors who are probably most likely left wing. I have uh, some, a lot of Larry Korea gun people who might be more interested in gun books I have some zombie people. I have uh, some just hardcore science fiction authors. So it, going to social media and putting up a buy link suddenly channels all these people in there that tell the, that by the time they purchase it, they tell the, mil the minion all kinds of bogus information. And the minion attempts to now sell your space marine novel to all those to separate group interests. And so the most important thing becomes getting about 100, you know, or even, hey, if you could even get 25, but getting 100 pure genre readers. 
And the way that you do that is by linking up with other writers who are successful in that genre and doing specific mail list swaps and not saying anything on social media for a week after you launch your book. If you, uh, I mean, if you really step back and think about it at, at, a, at an even higher level, it's just doing what you do when you write. When you're trying to write commercially, you need to identify your audience. Or if you're going to give a speech, you identify your audience, you identify how to communicate with your audience, and you write for that audience. Exactly. Same thing, same thing with sales. That's all Amazon's uh, AI is doing is saying, hey, we've got a thing. To the uh, to the AIs making these determinations, the, the, these are just programs that have that have this input. They've got all this data, and they're like, okay, I've got a thing, and I need to know how to sell it to as many other things as possible. That's it. Right. So it's the yeah, same. Yeah. If you thing were going to go down, any, if you were going, if go. you were going to go down to the store today, and you were interested in buying a mountain bike, and you walked by the yogurt shop, and you walked by the dry cleaners, and like. And all of these people were trying to sell you things. You'd be like, no, I'm, I'm headed towards the mountain bike shop. I'm buying a mountain bike today. That's the average Amazon reader. When they go onto Amazon, they're typing in. The, the, they're, they're saying, I want Jim Butcher style fantasy. Bam, that book comes up. And a list of recommendations. And that's, that's a good search and a, and a good track for your book. But what we're all doing is we're linking up with each. Please tell everybody about my book in your social media feed. And so what happens is what, what I said initially in this podcast that we, we, we developed and sold to people to tell them how to launch their books. They said, listen, I would have been the last person in the world to tell you that social media was bad for your books because I was one of those people who thought I would get sales out of social media. But now I realize social media is absolute death for your book sales. So uh, well, what is the trick? Do you, do you have a stable of people or, or do, you do, do you have a a list that you talk to, hey, I need you guys to buy this book. How do you, how do you coordinate the launch of the book then to really maximize? I assume you did something like that with Galaxy's Edge. We did something exactly like that with Galaxy's Edge, and it's probably for the foreseeable future the only way that I would I would launch the book. What we did is we did that podcast and we broke it down and showed everybody how to do it. But go ahead, Daddy Warfig. Um, he just mentioned a podcast where he and Jason. Uh, on Spock went through and broke down how to um, do this. I have included a link to where you can buy that podcast in the description. And I'll tell you why it's pricey, um, but it's worth it. If you're an independent author and you want to learn how to focus your marketing to people on Amazon, it's very, very much worth it. And um, the other thing is it works. And before we talk about uh, what details of that we want to talk about on the show here, can you tell people how successful the Galaxy's Edge launch was? So and, just and so they know. The other thing is with that with that podcast, I'm not going to withhold the information here from you guys. I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you how to do it. But if you go into that podcast, you really get the full breakdown and and it's it's value. There's a lot of value in that podcast. But I'm not going to be like, well, you have to buy my secret. No, I'm going to tell you really right now, but to speak to the success level, we made six, uh, we made $200,000 in six months. We got uh, approached for a film deal. We've been approached by a major comic book writer. We've had uh, a tactical RPG offer. Um, Podium immediately picked up all the books that we could sell them. RC Bray is doing the initial um, reading of the first Galaxy's Edge. Uh, some other things that are happening I can't talk about, but I can I can hint very vaguely that one of the biggest names to ever write Star Wars fiction is actually coming into our universe to write Star, Star Wars uh, to write uh, Galaxy's Edge fiction. So we're excited about that. But in other words, we made enough money, which is every what every writer is looking for, to pay your bills and to write full time at home, and. <laughs> And yeah. Audible called you up and asked you. Yeah, they sold themselves to you. Podium did. Podium and uh, Tontor. We, uh, Audible is now doing their own deals, as I understand it. And I've heard actually those deals are going off at six figures. Um, but we signed with Podium. Podium did the Martian. Podium is a little smaller than Tontor, which does is 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 big uh, 
is the biggest audiobook producer, I think. But Podium does sort of a higher quality. They get the great readers. Like, it's a really great finished product. Like I said, they did Andy Weir's The Martian. We have the same narrator for that, R.C. Bray, who's like a rock star. But to speak to how it is done in a nutshell, and there's there's some steps to the success. There's 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 building your platform, um, building building those genre readers that I talk about. We we developed a strategy that took six months to farm those readers by um, creating a subscription base, giving them content, doing podcasts, and very it, it's it has a lot to do with email list segmenting which it's kind of funny, like for a long time, email was the way that you marketed, you know, and then we all got like tons of spam and it was out of control. And then email fell out, fell out of favor. But then in the last year, email has really come back with a vengeance, especially when we say we see corporations and SJW shenanigans like at Patron or over at Twitter, or whatever, where they, or even Facebook, um, where they cut off your ability to talk to the people that you're trying to sell to that you've taken the time to cultivate. So what a newsletter does is it actually allows you unrestricted access to the people that want to participate in your world. So newsletters become very, very effective. And if you um, follow a guru that I follow, a guy by the name of Johnny Andrews over at Author Platform Rocket, um, he's a really big fan of the email list and he kind of revolutionized my email list game. And you use that to build those segmented genre specific readers that you can go to. And it might not be a 6,000 list or a 30,000 list, but if you've got 200 to 300 hardcore readers in that genre who are passionate about your project, most people don't know that's how Andy Weir got the, got the Martian. Andy Weir spent, I think it was about a few years, maybe five years writing the Martian chapter by chapter. And he would put that that chapter out. He's a he's a he's a, um, a developer by day, not a developer, but um, you know, a computer. Maybe maybe like what John is. And um, he was just putting out the chapters, and and they would refine and hone and beta read it for him, and then they would give him feedback. And they they what what happened unconsciously, and probably not Andy's intentional doing, but what he created among them was he allowed them to take ownership of his project and become uh, what religion, what religious groups sometimes call a street team. Uh, in other words, they began to go out and witness to the masses about this book. And they were genre-specific readers. They were hard science fiction readers. And so what happened is a small group of people, a small group of dedicated Spartans, changed the entire algorithm because it immediately pathed into those kind of buyers, seeded into those kind of buyers. So the way that you do it without having to do five years of doing chapters, and here's the big secret to the whole thing, and you don't even have to take the podcast or buy the podcast. This is exactly how you do it. It has a lot to do with being a Mongol Khan. Um, the Mongol Khans would be out there on the, 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 the plains, and they would decide that they were going to sack a city, and they, you know, they were divided up into tribes. And so they would meet the other Mongol cons around a, uh, a, a tribe of fire. And they would say, if you'll help me do this thing, I'll help you do that thing. And so the Mongol cons would, you know, go and they would descend on a city and cut everybody's heads off and pile the skulls outside. And that's exactly what Jason and I did. We found the other Mongol <laughs> con. You like that? It's a long way for a joke. Um, we found the other Mongol cons in our genre. And the Mongol Khans are all the the leaders. Um, so this would be people like Christian Callias, Justin Sloan, Jay Allen, Jasper T. Scott, um, Daniel Aronson, Nick Webb, uh, Raymond Wild, who I just did an email list about. These are all people that are trending hard in the space marine science fiction, space opera science fiction genre. And we approached them and we said, listen, we have an email list of combined about 10,000. And then we have access to another 13,000. We are willing to come out for you on your next project. If you're willing to tell our readers about our book, uh, your readers about our book on our next project. And so we did a lot of horse trading around the Mongol Khan fire. And what we found out, this was actually taught to us by the brilliant writer, Richard Fox, um, who does uh, the Ember War series. And he said, listen, this is how we all do it. We just trade newsletters. And and I don't think they realized, uncon I think they, maybe they did understand. I'm not going to take credit for it. But what I saw out of it was 
what they were doing is they were acquiring that pure also bought genre reader, pure genre also bought reader by selling to each other's mail list. These are people that had signed up for their mail list because they were interested in this author's space marine fiction. And so if they were interested in that, there was a high likelihood that they would be interested in yours if it was space. I just had a writer this week say, hey, I've got a new book come out coming out. And uh, could you could you tell it to everybody? And I had I looked at the book and I said, listen, your book is not my crowd. I know you. I like you. But your book is not my crowd. I would be doing a disservice ultimately to your also bots if I share this with you. I will kill your book. It was what I'm saying, because right now my crowd is very uh, science fiction space marine. So you can't just run out and collect writers. You actually have to collect genre writers. And the big win is if you're going to write fantasy, then you got to collect the leaders, the indie leaders. Um, don't get the trade pub writers because they have no clue what they're doing. Um, they're accidentally successful for the most part. That's going to get how, me in trouble, but I don't care. Here's something critical for people who are listening to the podcast to understand, uh, or listening to the show to understand. Because of the way Amazon markets books, if you write a Space Marine book, it's going to market you to people who are looking at other Space Marine books. And it is not going to market you to people who are looking at, for example, space opera or um, any one of these other many science fiction subgenres, cyberpunk. It's not right. going to market you to those people. So Amazon is in itself as a byproduct of recognizing what readers read, that is, readers are monogamous within a genre, readers self-select to calve off from the reading public and form a bubble of people who primarily read zombie novels. And another group of readers is self-selecting by their choice. They choose only to read Space Marines. They form a group of Amazon customers that only read Space Marines. And another group of customers form a group who only reads Steampunk. Okay? So Amazon markets to that reality of the people who are buying books on their site. So Amazon itself creates or aids in, uh, amplifies this effect so that when you're marketed as space marine fiction, you're only marketed to that group of people who read space marine fiction and pretty much no one else, nowhere Basically. else. Yeah. So you have to understand who you're going to be selling to. And Brad Walker just said this in the chat. Readers form virtual gated communities, find yours, sell solely to them or primarily to them. And once you have gotten the Amazon algorithm to clue into who you're trying to sell to, it will push your books to those readers in that ghetto, in that gated community. But here's the deal. And this is what Nick was saying as far as social media goes. This is very, very critical. If you have either a huge number of scattershot people buying so that Amazon doesn't know which of their gated communities to sell to, which ghetto to put your book in, then you're not going to be taking advantage of their selling technology to push your book. It's going to be confused and you're going to get lost in the noise. Moreover, if you get accidentally put in a really, really tiny ghetto, you have immediately limited the number of sales, uh, the number of people that Amazon itself is going to be selling to, which will limit your sales. Exactly. I love the, I love the stories. Uh, you know what, before I comment on that, I did want to get a quick question, uh, a detailed question from also from Bradford Walker in the chat. Um, if if you've got a book and you're trying to determine what ghetto it goes in, how do you figure out what keywords you want to use for a book? Is it obvious or? I think it, the, the the way like it used to there there were services like Kindle Samurai or Kindle Words or you know there are all these people that say they have these magic things, but those are just um, 
data mining things that are crawling Amazon trying to figure things out. I don't think they're actually effective. Um, Amazon tells you up front what to do. And we all try to outthink Amazon, but it actually gives you in KDB, if you search around, you will find a list of keywords that will trigger different categories. Um, and that that's how you can really refine down into, um, they don't have all the categories that I would like. Like I have yet to find a zombies category and you would think that there it would be in there. But within the bigger the bigger categories, they get more attention. So within like sort of science fiction, space, space opera, space colonization, space fleet, um, space marine there, there's some variants and it's it's fairly simple and the main thing and, and i think when i first started out and i and i and i think i did this on the old man on the wasteland i knew that vampires were hot and there were no no vampires in my book but i just put vampires in as a keyword and i don't know why the old man on the wasteland sold I, I still couldn't tell you to this day i just think it was a gift from god to get me on my way but i don't think i effectively sold it um so if you put vampires now in your keyword description um and that's when you go into kdp and you're, you're entering your book you get seven categories and so you if you find that kdp list you, you really look at your book and if your book is space marines and vampires then you want to find categories and keywords that really fit that don't try to surf wide and get time travel. Don't try to get romance if there's no romance. So that's the first step. Your seven keywords have to really come out of that genre, that, that, that word list that, that Amazon gives you. And then the next step is that it really has to reflect what's in the description of the book. And so it actually kind of helps to use those keywords again in the description as you're writing it. You know, the Space Marine Vampire is the story of a Space Marine Vampire who kills space marines because he's a vampire. Don't be that dumb. But uh, I'm just trying to use it to say that, that, that you want to use some of those keywords in that description. That will help. Getting it in the title is a super bonus. But the main thing is that when people pass the cover, which cover is 80% of the buy decision, and I'm going to tell a shocker prediction right now that I've been saying to everybody, there are two things that are about to confront the indie market. The first one is visibility. Visibility is going to become one of the hardest things to acquire, and it's one of the most crucial. But we'll talk about that some other time. Um, cover is 80% of the buy decision, and art is becoming the choke point right now. Um, people are getting away from the $50 artist who does 26 covers a day, and they're going upwards. I've paid upwards of two to $4,000 for a cover. Um, you can buy video game artists out there if you can find them. You can buy the leading artists, but it's absolutely imperative that you have a bookstore, major trade pub level cover. And yes, there are people that will give you a cover for $50 or $300. And I'm not saying they're not bad, but that cover is actually what's convincing the person that Amazon to lure to look at your book to read it. They really do look at the cover and it's 80% of buy decision. If they do then go down to the book description, that's got to be solid and sell them and it helps if the keywords reinforce it. And the first chapter helps so that when that person reads the sample, they immediately get the book that was advertised on the cover and it was advertised in the description. Did that answer that question? Or was there more? I, I should hope so. Yeah. Bradford hasn't said anything in chat, so you must have given him a lot to think about. I mean, I gave him something to chew on, but it's um, it's it, it just becomes this this thing that you have to approach intelligently, and you have to approach it um, conscientiously, and you have to really realize, just like, and it was brilliant for you to say, this is how you write a book. You don't sit down to write a book and say. I'm going to write a little bit of romance and some time travel and I'm going to put in everything and maybe even a recipe for a great, you know, uh, chicken Alfredo. No, when you write a book, you're going to write Conan. You're like, this guy is awesome with a sword. He rides into town. There's these two factions. There's a girl, there's a bar. And at the end, Conan rides off with everybody's money after killing everybody. Conan novel. Um, it, it's weird in Amazon there. It's, they don't, it's not really about highfalutin stuff anymore or PKD or challenging Philip K. Dick. It's not really about, you know, like if you're a writer who's sitting around right now 
and you think that you've got a really great Philip K. Dick science fiction novel inside of you, I would tell you, don't write that novel, right? Conan goes into a bar and kills everybody and gets money. Um, because even PKD didn't make money while he was alive. Um, it was just later that he became successful. Um, but it's, it's, if you want the really big sales, you know, the people who were, the people who were paying off their parents' uh, mortgage are people who are writing shifter novels where, you know, shifter space marine novels where, you know, those are the ones with, you look at the cover and it shows a guy's abs and he's a werewolf space marine. And it's, you know, stupid. I mean, like, that's kind of where Amazon is at right now. It's, it's really stripped down to sort of basic stuff. That, it sounds a lot like the pulp market from a uh, hundred years ago or uh, 100, 100%, 100%. 100%. And that's how, that's how people like Dickens. And, 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 and a lot of them got popular um, because they wrote something in the papers, in the penny presses that, that delivered, Oh, it's the orphan and he's down on his luck and he gets a bunch of money. And if you actually look at John Grisham, that's basically the formula of a John Grisham novel too. And that's why those people sell is because you read one, it used to be John Grisham, I don't think is written by John Grisham anymore. Um, but back when he did used to write his books, it was uh, crime, uh, redneck family, a bunch of money, chaos ensues. And people loved that. And so they wanted to see the next book and the next book and the next book. And when he started getting away from that is when the sales went downhill, but it just, it just has to be like, it's a formula and that's how Charles Dickens was. And that's, but it is very much, you know, like if you, if you look, you know, go dash over to Amazon and look at the space Marine category right now and read through all this descriptions, which is an exercise that I highly recommend to, to anybody who's going to write anything. Did you go through all the also bots and read everybody's description? Because in there is going to be some data mining that you can do on your own, which is going to tell you what people are looking for. You know, if, 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 if you read a description and it's weird and it's only got three stars and it's been out for a year, chuck it. But if you go over and you see Daniel Aronson or Marco Kluse and you see that they've got 3,000 reviews and they're ranking hard in the top 1,000, that, that's something you might want to pay attention to. So read the description of ranking books. Uh, especially in the genre you're aiming it for. My, uh, yeah, read the description. My question is this. Um, how do you tell what categories uh, are big right now? And that will change, obviously. And if, you're, if you were in TradPub, it would be a fool's errand to chase because you've got a two-year window. I mean, you write your book, you turn it in. It's not going to hit shelves for two years. So trying to chase what's hot literally right now is useless. But in indies, if you can write at pulp speed, you can get a 40,000-word uh, story, whatever the technical term is for it. I hate that, and I'm not going to talk about it. 4,000-word book. A forty thousand word book out and in Amazon in a month or two months, so you can actually notice what's hot right now and still get in on that and still sell off the back of that. How do you tell if you want to do that? How if you want to notice market holes and and react to them quickly? How do you tell what's popular right now? What categories? Well, what I guess I would popular? I would address that with two things. A lot of it actually depends on you. Because I guess that's the thing that we have left out of this discussion is the, the way that this works, the way that you get to 200,000 in six months. And believe me, you, we are not making the most money out there. I know two guys who are making 250,000 a month. There's a girl that makes a million two a month writing vampire novels. So we are not killing it. We're killing it. But there are other people doing far better than us. Um, so here's the deal. Here's how it really works. You do the first book Legionnaire, which is what we did for galaxy's edge. And you put it out there and people really like it. And what we found is, okay, so you know how you watch Netflix and you find Poldark on there, or you find uh, Washington spies Turnco, or, you know, even the walking dead when that used to be good. And you love this first show. That's what you, isn't that every conversation now at every party and everywhere? What show are you watching? Oh, I just binged all of Battlestar Galactica last night. <laughs> that's that's how that's how people are watching TV now. 
they're not waiting a week to find out what happens to Seinfeld. They want to watch them all right now. Well, the same thing is happening in the bookmark. The, the, the series, the series has become the huge thing. And sometimes they might not even look, which was Jason and I's initial plan to attack this market. We thought we wouldn't see big numbers until the fifth book. Because we knew there was this huge binge series reading audience out there. And they probably said, well, let's wait till they get to five books. Let's wait till they begin to wrap up the series. And then we'll jump in because I think they've been burned a few times on people who don't finish series. And no one say weird, I'm going to finish it. Um, so th the thing of it is, is um, when you start down that path, here's another trick about the algorithm that you have to understand. The algorithm only loves you for 30 days. After 30 days, it turns into a bad girlfriend that kind of doesn't care about you. And after 60 days, it's dating someone else. It ghosts you. It ghosts you. Yeah, you, you disappear. Your book is out there. And now that's where you have to learn, like from guys like Johnny Andrews, you have to learn how to sell your backlist. And you can make a lot of money selling your backlist, but your book is now backlist at 60 days. But it's really better that you decide your book is backlist at 30 days. So you now have to write a book every 30 days on Crayob, you say, impossible. No, it's not. You can team up and you can have a writing partner and you can each write a thousand words a day for 60 days and you will roughly get close to finishing a book. What you do is you stack books. So you take the summer off, you don't publish anything. The two of you get your heads together or just you and you, you crank out some books. I know Daniel Aronson, he does it all on his own. And I think he writes about two books a month. And he's killing it in science fiction and he's killing it in fantasy. Um, so you could, you could do that. You could live at your computer screen or you could be great at writing, or you could take, you know, three months to six months to a year off and stack about three to four books. And then what you do is you launch it and then 15 days out, you put the pre-order up for the next book. So you get a bump. And then 15 days from that, you launch the book, the next book. And then 15 days from that, you do a pre-order. And then 15 days from that, you launch and you repeat that every month. Because what we found is the binge reading audience will consume the books as fast as possible. If you go over and look at the Galaxy's Edge reviews, there are people in there who said, I just bought the first book in this series five days ago, and I just finished all of them. And we're at seven books now. So, you know, it's the, the binge reading audience is out there. And so the way to capture that and the way to stay relevant in the, in the algorithm and the way to make money is to stack books and have a series and be committed. So now you say, well, how do I find the original question? I remembered it. I remembered the thread, Debbie Warpig. The original question was, how do I find what's hot? Well, as John can tell you, the internet is so big, it doesn't matter what's hot. There is a lady, uh, to be crude, is making, I think, $68,000 a month writing Bigfoot porn. That's a, that's a, niche, <laughs> that's a niche audience. But the, the internet, most people don't understand the internet is so vast that there are sales enough for everybody in every genre. You know, there are probably some dumb genres like steampunk that don't do that well. Sorry. But um, generally, I mean, there, there are people making a living at steampunk. And there, there are enough steampunk readers for you to capture. There are some bigger markets. Romance is the most gigantic market. But are you, are you going to write romance? And so here's where I come full circle. It's not really about finding what, what's, what's hot. It's about finding how long you can distance run. That's what it really comes down to, because if you're going to write space marine fiction this month and you're going to you're going to get Galaxy's Edge going and it's really rolling right now, it's one of the hottest things in science fiction. But I am now chained to writing Galaxy's Edge fiction. I can't jump back to weird. I can't do my Gamma World project I want to do. I can't do my fantasy project I want to do. I've got to pump out these Galaxy's Edge novels and I love doing it and it's a lot of fun. But it better be a lot of fun and you better love doing it if you're going to do this algorithm. So it doesn't matter what's hot. It matters what can you sit down at the computer, typewriter, yellow tablet every day and feel passionate about and have enough resource material and enough inside of you to keep pulling up and entertaining. There is a great anecdote. One of the best biographies you will ever read is Steve Martin's biography. And it talks about how he became an entertainer and how his whole life was built on five minutes at a time, learning this, learning how to tell jokes for five minutes, learning how to tell jokes for another five minutes, getting all the way up to a 50 minute act. 
And one of the most pivotal moments that resonated for me in that biography is when he was on the tonight show and Johnny Carson was hosting and Johnny Carson had just been entertaining everybody by doing a goofy impression from Disney. And at the break, he turned to Steve Martin and he said, you will use everything that you ever learned in life to entertain people for five minutes more in this business. And that's really what comes down to the pulp rev in the Amazon binge reading thing that we're doing. If you're going to write Space Marine stuff, you got to be able to do it for the next two years every day, take a day off. Uh, but you got to do a lot of it. So, yeah, romance is huge, but can you churn out that much romance or can you churn out that much Gamma World? That's the question. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I'm not a binge reader. I'm not much of a reader at all. But I know someone who love, uh, loves romance and, and one of the biggest – names in romances nora roberts yeah and uh, she's extremely prolific and and makes tons of money i'm sure uh and uh she told me not nora roberts the reader told me that you know what they're enjoyable reads but very formulaic you know she's got a stock of characters and she'll just recombine them in a particular way add it you know change the setting a little bit and boom she's got another book yeah, that's and kind of how it works. And yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there are people that that do it that way. But I think with what we what we I, I think what Jason and I bring to it is we're both actors at some level. And we also were in love with a very specific um, space opera property that we wanted to to pay tribute to or do do our way for want of a better word. So there were a lot of stories that we wanted to tell using that. And, but yeah, you, I, I think out of what I've learned in the past year about writing um, at this, at this sort of like speed level rate tone is that cliche is cliche because cliche works. Like one of those things where you, you may have an 80% uh, you know, really cool story, interesting ideas and characters and stuff. But if you've got to fill those portions with cliche, if it works, yeah. And you don't have the time, you don't have the time to create everything out of whole cloth. You know, I think a lot of people want to write Tolkien straight up, but you know, they're afraid, you know, they spend all this time drawing a new world or um, inventing Elvish or inventing a mythology. It's like, how much easier would it be if you just kind of riffed on that and just kept moving forward? And I think that's kind of what Jason and I did with Star Wars. Instead of inventing a whole science out of whole cloth, a whole different version of hyperdriver and a whole different version of blasters. What we just said is this is a star Wars style universe. And this is a different story with different characters. And once we did that, we freed ourselves from having to be weighted down by coming up with a bunch of stuff that would sap our creative time in trying to invent the science of the universe. And we were just free to go ahead and tell stories. So, um, so, to, so to summarize is the, what what we just talked, or what you just talked about for a few minutes, that you, your techniques for uh, working Amazon's algorithm is going to help you maximize your sales on Amazon for the first thirty days. But for long term sales, you need a series plan or something, or, or a plan for selling your backlog and continuing to put out books that your readers are going to want to read. Correct. Yeah. And you like, we talk about all that in the podcast, but mainly it comes down to, you've always got to be relevant within the algorithm. So that's always publishing a book. You then have to always be selling your backlist and managing it and doing sales and marketing and all these kind of things. And to do that, you have to build a platform. A platform is a website. It's a blog. It's a social media presence and it's a newsletter. And if you have those three things going and you do that for three years, you would have to be pretty bad not to be able to support yourself as a writer at the end of that three years. And, and I'm not, you know, I shouldn't say that to people who can't do it, but I've talked with other people and they basically said, yeah, do this for three years and you will see a, a significant change in your life. And uh, I've, I've known people now in this situation 
that in the course of six months have walked away from their daytime job, their, their full time. And it should never be about that. I just went to this convention, this writer convention in Vegas, and I kept just hearing this, this recurring theme from people. They wanted to learn every trick and they wanted to learn the algorithm and they wanted so they could just quit their job. And that's not what writing is about because writing is a wonderful, fun business. It's also very solitary and lonely. And if you're prone to addiction or prone to mental illness or prone to depression, it can really work against you. And if you have an extended family or you owe people money or you, you live beyond your means, it can be horrible for you because everything can bottom out. But it's still a wonderful, fun life. And if you love the act of writing, if you love making your own D&D campaign and running your own characters through it and telling epic grand stories, or you like shooting your own movie and you, and, and you like it when people read it and then they comment back to you on social media and they just say, you know, this is a great Saturday night I spent with you and your characters. Or, you know, that thing really, like, that should be, an, not to be cliche, but that should be enough for you. And if you're honest and sincere about that, I do think that there's a way to, to make a living at that, but don't just be trying to find a way to manipulate this because you hate your job and you want to make money because most likely you will probably end up hating this too. It's not always great. And I'm going to be, I'm going to have a moment of honesty here. Other writers are fairly horrible people and <laughs> especially, you know, well, you, you guys know my story, right? You know? Yeah, and and we and and have you been following the the drama, the continuing ongoing drama in the soap opera that is science fiction writing? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Which is what is there something new? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, there's yeah, exactly. There's that. I just found out that there was a whisper campaign against me that was trying to say some things about my integrity and things like that, and I actually had to respond to that in private and say, "You're not in any kind of possession of the facts or anything like that." And I had to set that person straight with the information and they were chagrined because they said, well, this is the campaign that's been going around. So the problem is when you're a concern, like none of this, like I, I'm fairly sure that every person in this conversation is a conservative or right leaning in some way, shape or form or libertarian. Um, well, those are dirty things to be in, in writing straight up. And when the other side doesn't like it, they don't shoot and they can't stop the message. What they do is they go after the messenger and you can find yourself like, I think I weathered it pretty well and I came out quite well on the other side. And then you have someone like Larry Korea who came out pretty well on the other side, but that is not the case for everybody. A lot. I've seen them stomp down on a lot of people hardcore. So I'm just saying this writing business is great, but there, there are problems with it. And it shouldn't be about that. You like, like I said, I the, the way that Galaxy's Edge came about is that Jason came to me because we'd been doing another project that went sideways with a bunch of authors, and it was another, uh, uh, it was a bunch of big time authors in the indie community who ganged up on one author because they found out he had a different lifestyle than they did. They found out that he was Amish, and that that therefore that meant that he was oppressive to women in their view. And they pretty much blacklisted him and called him Hitler and the project fell apart. So Jason and I walked away from that project and he said to me, he said, well, where should, what should I do now? And I said the same thing to him that I said in this conversation, but I said it in, in a different way. And it's a thing that I say to everybody is you should write the junk that you want to sit down and read tonight. It's Saturday night. You're all by yourself. You're going to fix a martini and you're not going to watch TV and you're going to read your favorite book. What would that junk be? And Jason said it would be Star Wars. And I said, well, then you should write Star Wars. And he said, well, I can't write Star Wars. And I said, who says you can't write Star Wars? You can write the tone, the feel, the thing that Lucas was trying to go, because Lucas was ripping everybody else off. So you, you can rip everybody off and you can do it. No, you can't use Luke Skywalker. No, you can't use Alderaan. But you can make different things up and you can do that. And then he said, well, why don't you write it with me? And I said, all right, if it'll help motivate you, Jason, I will write it with you because I don't even believe in this project and it's probably not going to go anywhere. And so I half-heartedly participated for six months and then to, to round out everything, that shows what I know. It was the biggest, one of the biggest things I ever wrote. Well, we, <laughs> I've got one more question to ask because we are uh, sure. out of time. So... <laughs> I, I hope everybody found this conversation interesting. And I hope, again, I put the link to where you can buy 
uh, the after action report in the description if you want more detailed, more specific step by step information. But he's given all the essentials of it to you in yep. this podcast, so you can go ahead and make a, a a plan, a strategy to target your Amazon audience. But if you want more details, you can find that in um, in the link in the description below this video. This is my question, and it's been. I, it, I've been ruminating about this over the last two months or so. In an age of independent publishing, in which you're publishing directly to your audience through Kindle uh, or Kindle Unlimited or whatever, through Amazon.com, um, how important is the so-called community of writers? Well... I mean, I think that's what I was dancing around. I, I don't want to say that I hate all writers, but I've begun to learn to hate them. And I don't want to, um, I'd like it. I'd like there are people that I meet that I really like. And so like anybody who probably knows me and, and I like them, that's, I'm not talking about them. I'm but talking what, about in the yeah. in the sense of selling to the audience of making right. money as a career. How important is that? Do, can they really impact your career positively or negatively? They can they can do both. I think that's what I was kind of what I was aiming towards. And maybe I'm more talking about my own issues, but they can both hurt and help you. It's better to talk about how they can hurt you right off the bat because there's two frames of how they can hurt you. The first way that they can hurt you is meaning like without meaning to, but like if, if you are writing space Marine books and you happen to link up with Jim butcher and Jim butcher says, I'm going to, I'm going to plug your book. That's one of the worst things that can happen to you because Jim butcher's fans are not space Marine readers. So what you have to do, if you're going to be a, a space Marine writer, you got to get me and Jason to do it. You got to get Justin Sloan to do it. You got to get Richard Fox to do it. You got to get space marine writers who are killing it to help, and you and you can get people who aren't. You know, you can also get death by a thousand cuts. You can just get a coalition of willing, but they all have to be genre specific. So writers can hurt you because, and that's the problem with social media, and it was the problem with Twitter, and it was the problem with Facebook. Is we all join these writer groups, and suddenly you become friends with these people. And you get into their life just because, or you, or, you know, it's kind of fun to meet bigger writers like, you know, um, Eric Flint or, or, or uh, who else do I know? You know, like, like you can, or, or Michael Sterling or people like that, you know, you can, the great thing about social media is you can meet them and then you can meet people who like them and you have that in common and everything like that. But you better be writing like that because if any, if, the, if there's any sort of genre creep, it's going to hurt what you would do. So that, that would be the first innocuous way that other writers can hurt you. The second innocuous way is that the moment that they fi find out um, that you're different than them, whether it's politically or whether it's religiously, those are just, to be honest, those are the two things. Most of the writing community is, is hard. A small portion of the writing community is hardcore left and they're the most vocal and then there's this massive 80% that are sheep and want to be liked by people like John Scalzi. And so if John Scalzi says that um, so-and-so is a dirty bird, then they're all going to say so-and-so is a dirty bird without really knowing. And I found they don't take the time to investigate either. So uh, the problem with writers is that we're all very opinionated and we all think we're right. And so being a part of, of writing communities, you can, I have, I don't say this just because it's happened to me. But I say this because I've seen it time and time and time again. Writers are the first ones to get together and have a witch hunt and gossip behind each other's back. And then the other thing is, once you start to get successful, you will find that they will start to stab you in the back. The bad ones. The good ones will be happy for your success. And if they're smart, they will work with you because you will help them too, which is what I do. I try to help everybody who helps me. But you do get some pretty poison parries who don't mind shooting you in the back. And, and the minute that they can find out some kind of gossip about you, they run around and, and that can hurt yourself. So those are two ways that can hurt. The way that they can help is what I talked about in the Mongol cons and keep a professional relationship, approach them in a professional relationship. And sometimes I don't always buddy, buddy up with them because they might not like my politics and I might not like something. I, actually, I don't care what anybody does, but I found with what I believe in, 
and the things that I stand for is that they're more often prone to rea- to provoke a negative reaction in people. So professionally, when I'm working with other writers, I try to keep it to, I have this big list that's willing to come out for you. Do you have a big list that's willing to come out for me? But at the end of the day, there's a way around all that that I've discovered. And it's actually reproducible with BookBub ads. You can actually, if you if you go over to BookBub and you join their their writer program, and then you apply to do BookBub ads, what you can do there is you can actually target genre readers through ads. And the way that you do that is you build an ad graphic, has to be a certain size. You put your book in there, maybe a cool picture that kind of reflects your book, and then maybe one line of coffee copy. And you run that ad on BookBub ads and the cool thing about book above ads is it actually targets genre readers who are looking for zombie books. And that's a way that you can financially reproduce what the, the, the Mongol cons could do for you. The Mongol cons are cheaper, you know, but then you take, you know, the, the, the possibility that if they, if someone decides that you're Hitler, you get blacklisted, but in the space Marine crowd, I've found that they're actually all pretty cool and, they're pretty varied and they could kind of really care less. They, they like making their monthly mortgage payment on their new mansion. So we all work together and we keep it nice and polite. It's just, I think over in the quote unquote pro science fiction crowd, the tour and the, you know, the, 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 the sacred guardians of the Hugos. Uh, if you play with those people, don't be surprised if you get burned at the stake. So I would say have nothing to do with them. Did that answer it? All right. Um, do, uh, do you have any last words before we uh, kick off? Last words? What do you know? <laughs> last words are, you know, just have fun. And, and you know, of course, there was a bit of, of a jaded attitude that came through to me. But the inspiration and the hope that I would give everybody is it has never been a better time to be a writer. I was a writer 10 years ago in, you know, with a New York agent and there was an ivory tower and gatekeepers and there was no Amazon. And I always say, thank God for Jeff Bezos because it it provided a way for all of us great unwashed to literally take our product to the marketplace, Amazon, and let it be judged by the people on its value and merit. And it still really is that all that I'm talking about here in this instance are a few little tricks that you can do and you can learn in that podcast. There's some advertising tricks, things like that, that can give your novel the best possible chance to find a crowd of readers who love that kind of novel. And it, the burden on you is to write and produce a novel that fits that. I would say to everybody, get rid of trying to write the great American novel or the next great science fiction novel and just write something that's really fun, that's really well-written, that's thrilling and that takes readers from A to B. And if you do that and you get a really nice cover and you you apply this the philosophy that we've talked about, about genre targeting and also bots, if you do that, I can, over the past year since we launched that podcast, I have had a dozen people who have tried that launch, big and small. And all of them have said, it is absolutely produced results. It works. Um, that. That's it. Any, any last words, Dornall? I can't top that. Thanks so much for joining us, Nicole. Uh, it hey, was very pleasure. fascinating to hear your per- perspective. Thanks to everybody in the chat for uh, hanging out. Yeah, we're we're gonna have to do uh, we're gonna have to talk about the gaming stuff on another show. That that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're trying to get a Legionnaire game together, so that would be exciting to get everybody involved in kind of helping us design it um, because we've had a lot of requests for for that and. I want to base it on the old recon rules. Did you guys ever play recon? I did not. Oh, it, was, it was the great, it was, it had three attributes and everything was per, uh, percentile and it was set in Vietnam. That could be, that could be something. That was, it was epic. <laughs> it was, it was a great game. Well, uh, we'll see about getting uh, Nick uh, and maybe Jason back on the show to talk about their role-playing project coming up with uh, Galaxy's Edge. Um, Imperator just came out uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago. So um, 
go check that out. Or if you haven't read the Galaxy's Edge series, start with the very first book. Um, and I have to tell you, I am an anomaly among readers in that I don't stick to one genre. I tend to read from a bunch of different genres and pick the best people in those genres to read. And Galaxy's Edge is a great Mill SF, uh, which is military-oriented science fiction uh, military SF series. It is uh, phenomenal. It's a lot of fun. It is, if I could describe it, what if David Drake, instead of writing Hammer's Slammers, had been hired to write Star Wars? So <laughs> that that would be a that would be epic. Yeah, that yeah, that's I totally agree with that. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Um, if you go over to the website galacticoutlaws.com, um, you can actually pick up a free short story called Tin Man. Uh, which is uh, set in the Galaxy's Edge universe, and that can kind of give you some ideas. People really like that story. It's a cool story. Uh, yeah, Tim Man is a great story, and I've enjoyed all the other books. So I would uh, encourage you, go ahead, check it out. Um, buy, any of the random, buy any of the books in the series if you want. They're all great, great novels. So check that out. And then um, let's see. Let's go through the stuff for us. We're available here. Geek Gab is available. We generally do this every Saturday about this time. Uh, you can check us out on youtube.com slash geek gab, or we're available on the iTunes store. We're available on the Google play store and we are available on soundcloud.com. Just do a search for geek gab on any one of those platforms and you can get the backlogs of this great show. Uh, be sure to like the video if you enjoyed this discussion and subscribe. And once you've subscribed, double secret subscribe by clicking on the bell icon in order to get email notifications about when we're going live. Sometime this next week, we uh, anticipate throwing up a Geek Gab uh, game night to talk about role-playing games. And, of course, we will be back next Saturday with another great show. Uh, and I've got a couple of perhaps guests that are currently in a state of quantum indecision once I have observed which guests will be attending and the waveform collapses, I will let you, our audience, know. We are signing off for today, folks, but don't you worry. Don't you fret. We will be back.